Did anybody else just unfold the scene of that first verse? Wow. To be a soldier standing in the middle of a battlefield without any armor, without anything. That's how we feel sometimes, isn't it? Just feel like, man, I have no defense. I have no offense. I'm in trouble. I, I can't I can't do it. I can't make it. I can't and it's true, we can't. But God can. Oh, I need him to come on the scene, don't you? There's some things that you're facing right now. You need the Lord to come on the scene. If you're honest, you'd say that this morning. Oh, I need him to come on the scene. I need him to come on the scene. And you know what? He wants to come on the scene. He's just waiting to hear you cry out to him. He's just waiting for you to surrender it all to him. Can I be honest? The Lord's waiting on some of you to get over yourself. Amen? He's waiting on some. But let me put that a, a better way so it's not so hurtful to you because I'll include myself, and he wants some of us to get over ourselves. And there's just, just times that we get so caught up in our feelings and our emotions and all that we've been through. Why did this happen to me? Why me, Lord? None of you has ever done that, right? Why Why me? Why me? Why now? Oh, but when Christ comes, when he comes on the scene, amen. Turn with me back to Acts chapter 2. We were here last Sunday night. I was endeavoring to preach on the second win, but I didn't get past the first one. So we'll endeavor to get to the second win this morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 2. I don't know about you, but I desperately, desperately need that second win. You understand what I'm talking about as I get deeper into this. But our, our kind of our theme last Sunday night was just keep the pace. Sometimes we're just keeping the pace. Not, not just going through the motions, not running on a treadmill, not walking in, pay, in place. But we're progressing, we're moving, but we're about all we got just to stay in the race. And what do we do in those moments? We keep the pace. We keep running. We keep waiting on him. You think about those that gathered, the 120 that gathered in that upper room. Day one, day two, day three, day four. I'm not talking minutes here. I'm talking 24 hours. Maybe put it that way, 24-hour one, 24-hour two, 10 days, 2,400 hours, right? Any mathematicians in the house? 2,400 hours. And no doubt there was times and moments in there that some may have thought, I'm going down those stairs. Uh, uh, we've carried and carried and carried. I, I gave God a chance. I, I wanted the promise. I did better than the 380 that didn't, that didn't even show up, right? But I guess it's just not coming. I guess it's just not happening. But what did the Lord say? See, all kinds of junk goes on up here. But what did the Lord say? But what did the Lord say? All, all kinds of stuff comes into here. You know, I don't know who was in that upper room. I know by the time they got to, to the place that they needed to be. Let me read my text, and then you can sit down. Some of you look like you're tired. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. You may be seated. Because I might not even get to the second wind this morning. I don't know the, the mentality. We know that they were all in one place in one accord. We know that that's ultimately where they ended up. But I don't know the conversation. I know this. I know they were human. All right? We know that Thomas had the tendency to doubt. Peter had the tendency to do whatever Peter wanted to do. We, you know, you had, some, you had some folks in that room, and this is before the Holy Ghost, and they still had those same tendencies, but they made it to that upper room. So I don't know if one of them may have looked at the other and said, come on, it's been a week. I've got stuff to do. 
What do you got to do? Jesus said, follow me. And so we don't, we don't know. We don't know what happened. But it was in that moment, they said, forget this. Not forget staying here, but forget doubting. Because it tells us that they were all in one place, in one court, one place. So what does that mean? It means it, don't, it doesn't matter what, what went on in those nine days. It really don't matter what went on in those nine days and 23 hours and 59 minutes. But in that last moment, in that last minute, in the midst of that moment, a suddenly took place. And that's Acts 2 and 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Pastor, what are you, what are you talking about? I, I'm talking about all of us doubt from time to time. All of us think about walking down those stairs or walking out that door. I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I've seen some walk out the back door, and they haven't walked back in, and they did exactly what they wanted to do. I've seen some fall by the wayside along the way. I've tried my very best to, to reach for them and do everything I could to reach them, but could not reach them. They walked away. They walked away. And then there's times that we thought, man, maybe I should have just followed them. But as I said last Sunday night, you got to keep the pace. You got to keep the pace. Last Sunday night, I asked our youngest Christian, Lexi, being back, I said, do you ever feel like uh, just in this young walk that you feel like that you can't go on? She, she chimed back. Yeah, right now. Right now. And I just looked back there to her and told her, keep the pace. And then Lexi testified Wednesday night. She got a phone call before church that her best friend got saved. Why? I believe because Lexi's keeping the pace. So don't ever think, man, it's just, it's, just, it's just too tough. It's too hard. It's a struggle. Because it was in that moment that they all got in one accord in one place. What does that mean? They said, forget about this, forgetting about this. Does that make any sense? You need to forget about this, forgetting about this. What does that mean, Pastor? You need to forget about giving up. You need to forget about throwing in the towel. You need to forget about quitting. I believe George said he told Kayla and William when they first got married, he gave them some little counsel, and he said, don't even put divorce in your vocabulary, and you'll be all right. Didn't know what you told them? Don't even put that in your vocabulary. That's not in our vocabulary. Uh, me and Amy, 21 years of being married, you know why? Because divorce is not an option. Gracie got up and sung at church last Sunday morning, and she went down. I said, you know why Gracie got up here and sung so beautifully? Because her mom and I do not believe in abortion. Amen? It's not giving up. It's not throwing in the towel. It's not giving in to the world's agenda. It's not. Uh, so forget about the forget about it. If somebody here this morning would forget about the forget, you will not experience a suddenly. You will not experience the outpouring that you need uh, until you realize uh, that I have just got to stand here and realize uh, there's just times that I am vulnerable. There's times as that song unfolded, uh, just the image that you see there, I'm a naked soldier standing in a battlefield, and that's a horrible place to be, uh, all your vulnerabilities. Uh, but to know something, uh, you would say if there's a soldier standing there on the battlefield without any battle array, he's a dead man uh, and that's where I was at that's where you were at uh, that we were as good as dead we were as good as done uh, the devil had us right where he wanted us at uh, oh but thank God uh, that Christ came on the scene uh, thank God that God so loved the world that God so loved me uh, that he gave his only begotten son that if I would believe on him uh, I would not perish but have everlasting life I'm thankful to know my Lord this morning Thankful for his goodness. So you think about their dwelling there in that upper room. As we, we look back at what we talked about last week, we talked about the very first breath that we took was physical. The day that we were born, we took our first physical breath, and we've been breathing ever since. Nobody's going to do this, because if you weren't breathing, you couldn't do this. We've been breathing ever since. And just like in that physical, we need breath. And if we're going to do anything, we got to breathe. Anybody ever suffered from shortness of breath? It's hard to do anything. 
You, you begin to try to do something you can't do anything. So you need that breath, and that breath uh, is a necessity for us. Uh, and to know that, that that is what causes us uh, to be able to, on the natural side, to live our lives uh, and to be able to carry on and to move forward in life. There's also a spiritual breath that we need. Now, that first breath that, that Paul spoke about, he said that, that our first existence, that we were first in the nature of Adam, that first man, Adam, the carnal man, the fleshly man, we all bear the image. But he said, if we bear the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the spiritual, of the second man, Adam. So we've all got that part. Everyone under here is bore the image of the earthy. We've got flesh and blood. And we've got breath uh, in our lungs and, and this natural body and, and everything that I didn't pay attention to in science class makes this body operate. It makes it function. Everything is there. Everything that we need to operate and function is in our body. And we've, create, we've been created to do that. We were in the image and the likeness. Uh, but Paul let us know that that's not enough. It's not enough just to breathe H2O. It's not enough just to breathe water. It's, or breathe air and drink water and eat bread. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so there comes a point in our lives that we're breathing and that we're existing, uh, that we may have a good life, we may have a good career, we may have a great family, we may have position, or we may have nothing. We all really came to the Lord at different seasons. Uh, not everybody came to the Lord uh, from a crack alley, right? Not everybody was at the bottom of the barrel in dark, uh, uh, dark times in their lives. There's some, uh, I love to hear Sister Connie Thornton's testimony. She said, I've never known the world. So I got saved as a, as a young child, and I have lived for the Lord my whole life, not bragging. That's just the way it is, and I've lived for the Lord my whole life. So not everybody came from darkness, uh, that darkness into this, into this wonderful light. Uh, so we all came in different seasons in our life, uh, but the same is true of all of us. It don't matter how good we were. It don't matter how great we were. It don't matter how much money we had. Uh, everything may have been great. Uh, we may have not come from a broken family. Uh, everything was good good and everything was fine and if people looked at us they'd say man that's a good family that's good people and they may look across the street and say that's a bunch of crackheads over there we, we put those labels on people them people are messed up the Wyatts are messed up these folks over here they're great that's a good family we let our kids hang out with these kids we're not gonna let our kids hang out with these kids but they're both lost. They're both lost. We determine, we say, well, they're, they're good. And, and they've made, let's put it this way, they've made good of their breath. Maybe, maybe you've never had people talk like this around you, but my stepdad says, has said at times, they're a waste of breath. They're a waste of breath. They're, they're a waste of my time. And we begin to look at people and begin to think they're a waste of our time. And there are some people, I want to spend time with them, but they're not saved. But they're good to be around. They're good people. They're fun people. They're whatever. And so which, which, what I'm saying is no matter which side of that that you're on, things are going good, and you're breathing and you're living, and people think, man, I'm living my best life. I'm living a good life. Things are good. Career's good. Got good kids, and, and everything is great. But everything's not great unless you're born again. And so when we take that first breath in the spiritual, as Paul said, he said, as you bore the image of the earthy, you shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And so as we begin to take on that image, and we begin to take that first breath in the spirit of that altar, we're born again, we begin to run in this race. And the writer of Hebrews said that in this race, that we need to lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. And Paul reminded us that we're all in this race together, that there is no competition. There's going to be those that fall around us, but we've got to keep running. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep moving forward in this race. And we looked at that last week, and we got all the way to that place where we're in this race. We've taken that first breath, and now we're running in the spiritual race. And we've got to understand something. This is the last point I made last Sunday night. 
is we don't have any enemies in this race. We don't have any enemies. We have an enemy, but he's not in this race. We have an enemy that's trying to distract and trying to prevent and trying to throw up detour signs, but you do not have an enemy that's running. In the, if there's someone running beside you, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying your brother and your sister is not your enemy. The devil tries to put faces on your enemy uh, and say, they've caused me problems, and, and they've done this, and they've done that. Uh, and Scripture gives us plenty, plenty, plenty of opportunities uh, of restoration and tells us many ways uh, to make it right. Said, if you go to that altar and you know that your brother's got an alt against you, uh, don't even go to the altar. Go to your brother first. Get that right. Uh, and so Scripture just lays that out. Uh, how many times should I, uh, how many times should we forgive our brother? Seven times? And the Lord said, no, seven times 70 in a day. So realizing that if somebody's offended you 490 times in a day, maybe you're the one that's got a problem. So we have no enemies. This is not a competition. I'm not in competition with Brother Paul. I'm not in competition with Brother Kevin, Brother George, Sister Gilda. I believe they're all wonderful teachers and speakers, and Sister Donna Kay and Sister Amanda and others that speak. And I'm not in competition with any of them. I'm not in competition with Brother Crawley over at Clay Hill or Brother Hall over at Green Cove or Brother Javardo up in Orange Park or Brother Snowden in Doctor's Inlet. I'm not in competition with any of these men. It's not a competition. I pray for their church just like I do our church because we're in this thing together. We're in this thing together. I receive a text message uh, from one pastor on our region every Sunday morning uh, and just reminding us and encouraging us. Uh, I have another pastor that's not even church of God. I told Paul, he texted me this morning. uh, I said, he texts me every day. Every day he takes me to say, I'm praying for you. He don't have to do that, uh, but he realizes something. Uh, This is not a competition. It's not a competition. I'm not trying to outrun you. Uh, I'm not trying to beat you to heaven. Uh, matter of fact, I want to stay here as long as I can so I make sure all of you get to heaven. That's just the heart of the pastor in me uh, to say, I, I've prayed many times, said, Lord, I, I want to go, and I'll, if you're ready for me to go, I'll go, but I just soon stay here uh, as long as you're working, as long as you're moving, as long as you're drawing and dealing with people. Uh, I want to be a part of that. Uh, just when that rapture takes place, I don't want to be left behind then. I want to be gone then. Uh, but until that moment, see, we're trying to run this thing. And I, I said this last week, and I want to say it again. Two things that I said last week that I want to say again, uh, that he said, lay aside every Every weight. We've got to lay down those things that uh, weigh on our mind. It's not sin, uh, but it weighs on our mind and it slows us down. Uh, it prevents us from running this race. We've got to lay that aside. Uh, we've got to quit looking over our shoulder uh, to see who is catching up with us uh, and just run this race. Uh, we've got to notice when we see somebody slowing down, uh, don't say, don't st- t- take and criticize and ridicule them, uh, but encourage them uh, and set that pace for them. Them. Uh, you may be able to run a six mile an hour race, but you see them running three mile an hour. It don't hurt to slow down a little bit for a few moments uh, just to make sure they stay in the race uh, and be sure that they keep set that pace for them. Uh, oh, I know there's so much uh, that you can be doing. Uh, over the years, there's been those probably said that's an elementary preacher. He don't know much about the Bible, uh, but there's just comes times I have to set the pace for the ones that is running with me uh, to make sure that they just stay in in this thing uh, and stay in this race uh, and keep going. Another thing I said last week that I want to reiterate this morning is this. We cannot, we cannot afford, looking back to that verse, lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily beset us, to look at somebody. Why don't you pick that up? Why do you have that? You knew that was going to weigh you down. We have no credentials and we get real preachy. I got credentials, and I'm still careful on being preachy outside of the pulpit. Judgmental, a lot of times, is what it is. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not condoning sin, and I'm not saying that we don't preach against sin by no means, shape, or fashion. But listen, good church folks that's picked up sin, they're sinning. They know they're sinning. And when they begin to say, "I'm weighed down," it don't hurt to say, "Well, you're weighed down because you picked up that sin." And as soon as they say, "I know," don't go into 
investigating the situation. So let's go back and find out where you picked up this sin. We don't have time to be backtracking. We don't have time, uh, but what we do at this moment, uh, what I'm telling you as pastor preaching this message this morning, what I'm saying to a person that's here this morning, uh, that you're weighed down by anxiety and thoughts that's been hindering you, uh, or you even got weights of sin, that you picked up some sins, uh, and if you wanted to step up and and confess and say, uh, hey, pastor, I sinned. Uh, I came up short. I missed the mark. That's what sin is. We think sin, uh, and we gasp, and we think they murdered somebody. They committed adultery. Uh, Sin is simply missing the mark. And if we really broke it down, we would begin to realize, hey, I sinned. I missed the mark. God told me to do this and I did that. God directed me in this way and I didn't want to at that moment, so I didn't do it. And that's sin. To know to do good and do it not to him, that is sin. So we got that sin, we got that weight of sin, uh, and what I've come to tell you this morning uh, is it's not, it it don't, uh, not saying it don't matter to how you got that sin, uh, but you've already got it. You've already picked up that weight, uh, but what I'm telling you this morning, you can't keep running with that weight. Uh, You can't keep running with that sin. You can't. uh, One man said, uh, hey, how do I get there? And he just looked back at him and said, you can't get there from here. And if you continue to be weighed down and say, well, I want to hold on to my sin and I want to worry about everything, but I still want to make it. You can't. It is not possible. You've got to lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets you. So if that's you this morning, that's you. I'm not saying, I'm not preaching to the ones that said, not just to the ones that says, hey, I have no weights and no sins. I'm ready to run this race. I feel like running my last mile home. If you're here this morning, you feel that way, just wave at me. I, I feel, God, there's no weights and no sins. I feel like running my last mile home. I want to see you because you know, I'm going to need you as my amen corner. Wave at me. I feel, I'm ready. I feel like I'm running my last mile home. But I am talking to you, but I'm also talking to those who says, I don't know if I can make it. My mind is racked with so many thoughts. I, I told told Amy we've, we've been doing some work around the house and I said I thought of this at 3.30 this morning because your eyes open and that mind just starts and we lay there and we begin to think and we begin to ponder maybe there's a lot of things spiritually that you're there that, that you're endeavoring to do something for the Lord but your mind feels weighed down and this thought and that thought is bombarding you or you just say I've just flat out sinned I've picked up so many sins I, I don't even I don't even know if I can make it anymore. I really don't even know why I'm in a church building this morning. I've weighed myself down so much with so much sin. And you're telling me to keep running? I don't even know if I'm moving. Well, you're in the right place. Because, you know, the first step to being able to run good, laying aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Any of you guys ever go to the tractor pulls? They get that truck, and they'd hook that trailer with that sled to it, and that thing would go good, but as that weight began to get on that truck, what happened? It would bog down. And that weight of sin begins to get closer and closer and closer and heavier and heavier and heavier. And you're just spinning your wheels. Uh, I'm talking to somebody this morning that's just spinning your wheels. And the devil says, you're done. Uh, You tell the devil, I'm not done. My wheels are still spinning. I'm bogged down, yes, uh, but my wheels are still spinning. Uh, I'm still in a forward motion. Uh, Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, looking unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. Uh, See, the devil sees you standing still and not moving forward, uh, and the devil wants to tell you, you're done. Uh, And I told you this last week, the devil wants to keep telling you, you're done, you're finished, it's over, uh, because he knows uh, that he cannot cause it to be done, uh, finished, or over. It's you. You have to quit. You have to stop running. You have to say, forget it. I'm not going any further. I'm staying right here. I'm done. I'm finished. Can I tell you, forget about the forget about it. 
forget about the forget about it uh, and say, uh, I may be bogged down. I may be weighed down. I, I may have done some wrong things and picked up some wrong stuff, uh, but this is not who I am. Uh, this is not who God called me to be. Uh, this is not where I'm supposed to be. Uh, it's, we talked Wednesday night about God's plan for our life. Uh, I'm tired of doing it my way. Uh, my way has got me weighed down. Uh, my way has got me filled with sin. Uh, my way has got me surrounded by dark. I'm talking to somebody this morning. Uh, my way has got me messed up. Uh, my way has left me broken. Uh, my way has left me empty. Uh, my way has left me void of understanding. Uh, oh, but I uh, still want to move forward for God, uh, but I just don't know how to. Uh, you're in the right place uh, and the right time. Uh, and he says here uh, that we need to walk uh, in the light of his word uh, and that we need to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily, so easily, so easily. Why is that? So easily weights and sins beset us. You know why? Because Brother George told us last Sunday before he said, we don't love God like we should. We're not in love with his word like we should be. We're not in love. We, we tell our spouse we love them and we never talk to them. You think they're going to believe that? But we tell God, oh, I love God. But we never take time to talk to him. You tell your spouse that you love them. See, we are married to God. We are the bride of Christ. We tell our spouse, I love you, but every time you talk to them, can you make me a sandwich? Can you do this? Can you do that? I need you to do this, and I need you to do that. Oh, pastor, you sound a lot like my prayer time. Right? God, I need you to do this, and God, I need you to do that. We've got God mixed up with some sugar daddy. The thing, God, I need you to move here. God, I need you to move there. And God, and God says, wait a minute. That's not why I saved you. That's not why I called you. Uh, there's benefits to serving the Lord, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Uh, all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, you'll be able to do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. Uh, we've got to change that perspective. Uh, and we can find, you can ask any runner, I believe. I don't know a whole lot about running don't like to run physically uh, but I love to run spiritually uh, but I believe that when you begin to look down uh, and always concentrating on the run looking down at your feet checking your heart rate that's what I do oh, my, my heart's about to blow up I got to stop I told a pastor the other day he said how did you lose all that weight I said I walk I said I ain't running I walk he said, well, I like to run. I said, well, I probably would too if my heart rate didn't shoot up to 175 and a, or to 180 within the first quarter of a mile. I said, no, I'm done. I'm out. But we begin to focus on all of those things. But when we think about it, a runner will tell you. I know it's, it's this way in, in Scripture. It tells us that about that, that farmer will begin to, to hold that line and begin to make that feel that he gets his eye on a tree. At the end, and he just begins to take that plow, and he has that straight line because he's right in line with that that he's looking. This is what Paul was talking about when he said, I look unto the mark of the prize. They don't have their mind on anything that's set ahead of them. You watch that line go like this. Two things. If you ever see me running, look, see if somebody's chasing me, see if the ice cream truck is in front of me, if it's neither one of those, you're going to find it. Okay, he's trying to become a runner, and you're going to see that I'm going to be like this. Because I'm telling myself I'm going to die. I, I can't make it. I, I can't go any further. And I believe that any runner will tell you that you've got to get your focus beyond here. You've got to get your focus beyond what's in between these ears. See, your mind thinks that you can do less than you really can. And your heart... Follow your heart. You better not follow your heart unless your heart's right with God. Scripture says that the heart is highly deceitful. 
And so when we begin to follow any of our emotions and anything that is set within us, we're not going to finish this race because that's where the devil likes to get in the details. He likes to, he can put thoughts in your mind. He can, uh, he can put doubts in your mind. He can put distractions and detours in your mind. He can tell you your heart's going to explode within your child. You can't make it. You can't go on. I'm talking spiritually. I know I've been humorous in talking about me endeavoring to run, but I'm talking uh, spiritually. We've all been there. Uh, the devil says uh, you can't go any further uh, and you've got to take that focus and shift that focus from what you're doing here. Uh, listen, sometimes, uh, many times, ministry is difficult. Uh, even in ministry, if we get focused on the ministry, uh, get focused on the, the, the duty of ministry, we're in trouble. I've watched a lot of pastors get caught up in the duty and the obligation uh, and turning the lights on, making sure the toilets are clean, making sure the air is set, uh, making sure all the details uh, of a church service. Uh, many times church people just think you show up, uh, have church and go home, uh, but the pastor comes early, the pastor leaves late, uh, and the pastor doing this and doing that, uh, and there's administrative, uh, and there's all the things that I've seen, uh, and I have been guilty at times. You get so called up uh, and co- so consumed about this race that we're running in to forget that there's a finish line that you got to make. And if you're so focused on the race, you're going to miss the purpose of the race. He said, Paul said, they run to receive a corruptible crown, but us an incorruptible. So we're not in competition. We all desire to cross the finish line. But you're going to feel like you can't finish the race. Matthew 24, 12 and 13 says this, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. We're still running on the first wind. We're still running on the first wind. There's some here this morning that you're, you're still running on the first wind. That means you're still running on that born-again experience you're, you're still glad to be saved and glad you're not on your way to hell and, and you've set a pretty good pace. But there's a point that you're going to need a second win. I talked to Brother Underwood about this one time because he was a runner and talked about this. I said, I heard there's this thing called a second win in running. Can you explain that to me? And he explained it to me. He said, all I can tell you, Bishop, is when that second win kicks in, he said, it's a strength like you couldn't begin to fathom. It's something that takes place. He said, it usually comes in that moment where you feel like, I'm done. I'm done. I can't go another moment. But he says, something begins to take place and something triggers in the heart, in the mind of the runner. I said, okay, there's the problem. I'm not a runner. You got to be a runner. You got to be focused on the run. You got to want to run. You got to want to be in the race. And there's just some people that don't want to be in the race. There's some people that don't want to be running. They're running because that's what mom and daddy wanted them to do. That's what grandma and grandpa told them they're going to do. You're going to run, but you've got to make up your mind. I want to be in this race. I want to serve the Lord. Uh, That's why uh, I don't grab people's arms and throw them in the air when I pray for them. I said, if you want to uh, surrender to the Lord, I used to do that. I used to go down to the altar and put people's arms in the air, and I said their arms are in the air because I put them there. Uh, So I've just got to the place that I look at them and say, if that's what you want from God, you put your hands in the air. If that's what you want from God, you open up your mouth and you tell people, like, pray for me, this. Pray for you. Pray for me for that. Uh, well, you've got God. Sister Amanda said it this morning. He wants to hear the words out of our mouth. Uh, he wants to hear us cry out to him. Uh, I can come and say, uh, well, Lord, uh, sister so-and-so wants you to do this and needs you to do that and needs you to do that. Uh, and uh, there's times that people say, pray for me. Uh, and I pray for them. And the Lord comes back and says, well, I would love to do that, but I'm waiting on them. Got you, Lord. I prayed for you. You need to go talk to the Lord. You need to go talk to the Lord. That second win is a phenomenon in in distance running, usually. Like a marathon or those long runs. Also, it happens in other sports as well, but it's where an athlete who is too out of breath and tired to continually suddenly finds the strength to press on to the top performance 
with even less exertion. How is that even possible so late in the race? Everything is gone. All is gone. But then on the spiritual side, you may feel that way. You may feel like in the spiritual race, you've given it all you got. But it don't feel like you have enough breath to finish. You feel like, man, I've done everything that I know to do. I've been running, and I've been running, and I've been running. But you've been running on the first win. Second win's coming. Day one, day two, day three, day four for those 120 in that upper room. Running on that first win. Running on that fresh breath of the Spirit, that fresh word from the Lord said, Go and tarry you into Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Man, they ran off of that all the way to Jerusalem. They ran off of that for 10 days there in that upper room. But they knew, and the Lord knew, that they were going to need a second win. And we realized that that's got to happen. It's not time to stop running, it's time for a second win. Acts 1 and 8, first part of the verse says, You shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, when, when you're out of breath, when you feel like you can't go on, when you feel like, man, I know I'm saved, but I'm even beginning to doubt that. I, I don't know if I can keep running. I don't know if I can keep going. So many people want to uh, put the process uh, out of the window. They want to be saved and satisfied. Uh, but we need to be more than saved and satisfied. We need to keep running until we're sanctified. We need to keep running until we're sanctified. We need to keep running. Until we receive the promise of the Father, till we're full of the Holy Ghost. He said, you shall receive power uh, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Uh, when we breathe that second wind, we're going to receive power. Uh, power to do what? Power to witness, but also power to run. Not just power to run, uh, but power to finish. Uh, somebody needs the power to finish. Uh, somebody feels like you can't go on. You know what you need? Uh, you need a second wind. You need the power to finish. Uh, I started out to win this race. Uh, I started out to finish this race. Uh, I started out to cross the finish line. Uh, and it says in Acts 2 and 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Uh, those there in that upper room had been keeping the pace uh, for three and a half years. Three and a half years. Peter, keeping the pace. Andrew, keeping the pace. Follow me. They followed Jesus. Jesus was setting the pace. Jesus set the pace for his disciples, and they came running. As he came running by the Sea of Galilee, and they said that he set the pace, and we can just see them. We picture these runners. We picture Peter and Andrew running with Jesus, and then all of a sudden, uh, th- these these two and three men become twelve, and then twelve become five hundred, uh, and then we see some subtraction. Five hundred becomes one hundred and twenty. Uh, it didn't matter. It's always good when we see the numbers going up, all right? When you go from two to twelve to five hundred. They got church growth seminars. How to take your church from 50 to 500. It's all about the growth. It's, it's exciting times when they're, but then all of a sudden that 500 drops to 120. You know what they had to do? Keep running. Keep running. When those fell around them, they had to keep running all the way uh, to the upper room. It was not about who dropped out, but it was about the destination. Uh, it was about getting to Jerusalem. It was about getting to uh, the upper room. Uh, 120 individuals had to make up their mind, I'm getting to the upper room. Uh, they may have encouraged one another, keep running, keep going, uh, but sometimes encouragement don't work because 380, uh, with all the encouragement, with all everything that was uh, pushed into them and said, come on, you can make it, uh, they still didn't make it. There's just some people uh, is just not going to run. Some people's going to give up. Some people's going to quit. Uh, some people's going to forget about it. But you need to forget about the forget about it. I think I'm going to change the title of my message to that today. Forget about the forget about it. Uh, at this point, when, when we see those falling around, we've got a destination. Uh, where did the Lord say go? The upper room. It's not where are you going. Oh, that sounds better. That happened to 380. I guarantee you in one instance it was one that led a multitude. We don't, we don't know. We, would be, we just have to go by human nature. But now they're down to 120. And they didn't say, man, this number's dropping. They just set the pace, kept the pace. But now the problem was the pace setter, Jesus, was gone. He was long gone. What do we do? He said, I will not leave you comfortless. He said, you're going to need. Uh, He said, I must go back to my Father, and I've got to go back to heaven, but I'm not going to leave you without a pace setter. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you always. That's God. That's God. And the Holy Ghost is just as much God 
as Jesus. At this point, they're there, and he's long crossed that finish line, but they kept the pace until what? Until the new pace speed new pace setter came on the scene the power source the promise of the father the suddenly the second wind however you want to put it the holy ghost of heaven came down the third person of the godhead the holy ghost listen the holy ghost did not just show up in scripture in acts chapter 2 Holy Ghost was in the beginning. Let us create man in our light and light. There he was in Genesis. The Holy Ghost. Throughout the Old Testament, you find the Holy Ghost. Uh, he did not just show up, but this was his moment. Uh, this was his time to fill these people. Uh, now they had walked with the Spirit. They had been with the Spirit. Uh, he said the Spirit was with you. Jesus was with you. Uh, he said now the Spirit's going to be in you. Uh, I'm going. To, you've been baptized in water. He said he's going to baptize you in fire. Uh, there's an anointing. There's a power. Uh, there's a, a phenomenon called a second wind and distance running. Uh, there's a phenomenon uh, in this Christian race called the second wind, uh, better known uh, as the Holy Ghost. Uh, can I tell you he's phenomenal? Uh, can I tell you uh, he's astronomical? Uh, can I tell you uh, he's what you need to finish this race? Uh, if you're here this morning, you say, yes, pastor, uh, I'm saved, but I'm bogged down. Uh, yes, pastor, uh, I'm trying my best to keep running, but I can't keep going. Uh, you need a second wind. Uh, you need to the only way that you're going to make it uh, is a second win. Uh, there's runners that never get the second win and they never finish. Uh, but we can get that second win uh, that we may uh, have the power not just to run. Uh, but he said when you receive the second win, you'll have the power to finish. To keep running. Just stand with me. Acts chapter 2. Back to verse 2. We're going to read a little further. That second win came. After all that running, after all that running, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. That second wind came. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It sat upon each of them, and they were all, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Lord does not say, I'm going to fill you this service, and I'll get you tonight, and we'll take care of you Wednesday, and we'll take care of you next Sunday but they were all if you're here this morning and you're not filled with the Holy Ghost you can't say well it's brother so and so's service it's sister so and so's service it's for all when the second wind comes God can send that second wind to fill the spiritual capacity of every man woman boy and girl under the sound of my voice there appeared on them cloven tongues like a fire and set on each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you're here this morning, we've had a couple say, I feel like running my last mile home. They're pace setters. They've been setting that pace. But even with pace setters, we feel like I can't go on. You need a second win. You need a second win. You cannot... If you're here this morning, you've not been filled with the Holy Ghost, you cannot keep running without the Holy Ghost. You need that power source. You need that we believe in the complete gospel, and the Holy Ghost completes the gospel. So many are satisfied without the Holy Ghost in their life, without His presence, without that second wind, that promise of the Father. But if you're here this morning, you say, I'm... I'm weighed down. I'm bogged down. Maybe you've even picked up sin. Maybe you've dropped out of the race. You're backslider. God's mercy was renewed this morning. And God's saying, I'm giving you an opportunity to get back in the race. How can you say that, Pastor? Because He let me back in the race. He let me back in the race. And I'm bound to finish. I'm bound to finish. But I knew that I could not finish this race without the second win. Your first win, you feel like it's about to run out. So you need a second win. If that's you here this morning, you've not been filled with the Holy Ghost, but you say, I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want you to step out. Just stand across the front of this church with your hands raised and say, Lord, give me that second win. Give me that second win. Give me that second wind. I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost this morning, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't come and bury your face in an altar, but come with your hands raised. Come with your hands raised. And say, Lord, I want to be filled. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want that second wind. I want that second wind. I want that outpouring. I want the third person of the Godhead. It's not just about tongues. It's not just about running. It's not just about shouting. It's not just about emotionalism. But it's that second wind that I need to finish this race. It's that second wind that I need to keep running. To keep running. Somebody needs to obey the Lord. 